In today's video, we'll be looking at scary true crime TikToks that you should not watch before bed. This infamous 13-year-old killer was just released from prison after 28 years. On the morning of August 2nd, 1993 in Steuben County, years. New York, 13-year-old Eric Smith spotted a four-year-old boy named Derek Roby walking by himself. Derek was on his way to summer camp as he lived just one block away from the camp. His mother claimed that this morning was the first time she'd ever let her son walk anywhere by himself. Eric lured the young boy into the woods and violently attacked him with a rock. Mm. When Derek's mother was informed her son never made it to camp, she alerted her authorities, and within hours, the four-year-old's badly beaten body was found close by in the woods. At first, authorities thought that the killer was an adult, but Eric began to act suspiciously, attracting attention from others, and soon he confessed to his mother, who turned him in. Eric was supposedly brought up with a rough home life and was diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, a mental condition which causes unpredictable and often violent behavior. He was sentenced to nine years to life in prison, but now, as of 2022, the 42-year-old Eric Smith has been released from prison and is living life as a free years. man out on parole. Derek's parents actually say they're relieved that Eric's out on parole, as it means they don't have to attend his parole hearings and they can finally move on. Do you think young killers should be released when they're older, or do you think they should be treated like adults and spend life in prison? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Dude was a natural born killer. Oh, you're so traumatized, it makes me want to cry. You dumb bitch. The case referred to in that video was the case surrounding killer Nathaniel Bar Jonah. The one case I've never been able to get over. Hmm. Nathaniel was a normal man who lived surrounded by several neighbors. But Nathaniel had a dark side. Nathaniel would kidnap and do terrible, terrible things to several different children. Zachary Ramsey would end up being one of the people that Nathaniel kidnapped that people made an uproar about. He was an entire movement and everyone was trying to find this lost child. Shockingly enough, a few days after Zachary had gone missing, Nathaniel decided to have a little bit of a party with his friends. He invited people over and he served up burgers and sandwiches and stuff like that and it was just a good time. Now a little while passes again and the police begin to get involved with all of these missing children cases and they pin down their prime suspect to be Nathaniel. So they take him into custody. But there's one part of this whole thing that I'm leaving out from you guys. Remember that party I told you about that he threw? Well, Nathaniel did not use regular burger meat or lunch meat for his sandwiches oh, no, and burgers. Yes. Unfortunately, the meat that was used was the flesh of these young missing children. That's just nasty. And that's just messed up, ain't it though? Mm. See, man, I'm gonna go vegan. I can't even do it, y'all. Can't even do it. I don't know what I'm eating, so... I just might as well go vegan, for real. Thankfully though, at his trial, Nathaniel would be convicted of aggravated assault, kidnapping, and assault. He would then be sentenced to 130 years in prison. It's an extremely dark case, and now you understand why I made this video. You will not believe who the killer was in this child murder case. It was August in 1993 in New York when four-year-old Derek Roby was making his way to summer camp. Wait, wait, he only lived this? one block away and his mum claims that this was the first time she'd ever let him walk anywhere on his own. Tragically, that afternoon, Derek's remains were we found. Did. He was discovered in the nearby woods about halfway between his house and his intended destination. He'd been lured from the pavement, strangled and beaten with rocks. Disturbingly, he'd been SA'd with a stick. It's also worth noting that when he was found, he had Kool-Aid poured all over his body. Bizarrely, four days later, 13-year-old Eric Smith offered to so help with police the with the case. Though. When police questioned him, he initially claimed to not have seen Derek that day, but he then did keep changing his story. Now, when Eric's dad attended the police station to see what was going on, he offered Eric some Kool-Aid. Eric reacted very bizarrely to this and threw the Kool-Aid on the floor. At this point, police were very suspicious of Eric, and they also mm. found out from neighbours that he'd been asking very strange questions. These were questions all about DNA evidence and also what would happen if they found that a child had killed Derek. Shortly after, Eric did confess to the killing. He claimed that it was because of his anger about being bullied by other kids. At the age of 13, he was convicted of second degree murder. This is a more recent picture of Eric and he was actually released from prison in February of this year. This is the Hello Kitty murder. This is Fan Min Yi. Uh, Hello and Kitty And on March murder. 17th, 1999, she was abducted by three men. And during her imprisonment, she was tortured and raped. She was beaten with metal bars and sometimes even strung up and used as a punching bag. The mm. men even rubbed spices onto her wounds, 
and burned the bottom of her feet with candle wax and hot plastic so she couldn't walk. They she was forced evil. to eat human feces and urine and was subjected to horrible torture. On April 15th, 1999, fans succumbed to her wounds. Her captors weren't home, but when they got back, they dismembered her body and boiled her remains. They then sewed her skull inside this Hello Kitty doll, giving the case the name the Hello Kitty Murder. She was only 23 years old, and during those months of capture, she literally went through hell. This literally. might be one of the most disturbing cases ever. This little girl was kidnapped in 2018 and has just been found. On the 25th of October 2018, four-year-old Aranza Lopez was on a supervised visit with her biological mum. Her mum, Esmeralda, was being investigated over abuse allegations, so Aranza was actually in foster care at the time. Mm. It was arranged that the pair would have a supervised visit at a Washington shopping Dang, centre. However, the during the visit, Esmeralda requested to take Aranza to the toilets and use the opportunity to snatch the little girl in a stolen vehicle. Mm. The FBI were notified and a huge search for Aranza and even advertised a $10,000 reward. It wasn't until a year later that Esmeralda was found and arrested, but there was still no sign of the little girl. That was until last month. She was recovered by Mexican authorities in February in Western Mexico. In 2021, Esmeralda was actually extradited back to Washington state and pled guilty to second degree kidnapping and robbery. She was sentenced to 20 months in prison. This is why you should not she believe not anything daughter, right? you see on social media. A TikTok star named Mahek Bahari, aged just 21, has been accused of organizing a hit on her mother's lover. 46-year-old mm. Ansarine Bakari had been having an affair with 21-year-old Saki Pusan. Now, this affair had been going on for three years when Ansarine, a married woman with two children, wanted to call the affair off. The only person in her family that knew about this tryst was her 21-year-old daughter and TikTok influencer Mahe. Needless to say, this situation was messy, but it got even messier when Sahi did not take their breakup well. He simply didn't want the affair to end. Sahi then threatened that he would release compromising photos of Ansari mm. as well as videos and messages to her husband. Absolutely terrified, Ansarine told her daughter what was happening. The pair knew that if this affair got out, their entire family would be broken. So on the 4th of January, 2022, Mahek sent her mother this text message. I'll get him jumped by some guys. He won't know what day it is. On the 11th of February, 2022, Sahib was found deceased in his car along with mm. his childhood best friend. Now, moments before that car accident, Sahib had actually made a phone call to the police. He had rang them asking for help. He said there were two cars on the road following him, trying to ram him off the road. He said he was worried for his life. Ansarine was sitting in one of those cars and shortly after midnight Sahib would crash his car off the road into a tree. Since the accident, Ansarine and Mahek have both been arrested along with six other men. It's important to note that this court case is still going through the court system and although the evidence presented so far is compelling, a verdict is yet to be reached. Hey, that's Hi, crazy. my name's Harves and I tell true crime stories. If you don't want to miss any of my content, I suggest you follow. What happened inside this house gives new meaning to the walking dead. On November 15th, 2004, this man woke up, he went to the bathroom, he did some chores, he even got locked out of his own house and had to use a spare key to get back in. And that wouldn't be strange, except that night, Peter Porco and his wife Joan had been intact in their bed and Peter had been hit in the head with an ax 16 times. Dang. Peter died that morning, but Joan lived with severe facial disfigurement, and when police started investigating, they noticed some strange things. Like, there was nothing taken from the house, there was nothing out of place, and the house's security had been turned off using the Porco's secret password. And that's because the person who was convicted of these crimes is Chris Porco. There's oh, Waiting all night in the woods in Mount Vernon, Ohio, Matthew Hoffman stalked a young girl and her family. He waited until the girl and her brother came home from school, and that's when he entered the home and unalived the girl's mom, brother, and a family friend. Mm. He then kidnapped and locked her in the basement. He dismembered the bodies and hid them in an H area north of town. Thankfully, police did find the little girl locked in his basement on a bed of leaves. However, the interrogation took multiple days until Matthew admitted where the other bodies were hiding. He was sentenced <clears throat> to life in prison without- Warning! Viewer discretion is advised. Crazy story, ja. In 1980, single mother Dorothy Jane Scott from California kept receiving mysterious phone calls while at work. She thought the voice sounded familiar, but she could never place it. 
The mystery man would call and tell her that he knew where she was every minute of the day, and often threatened to c*** her into pieces. One night, Dorothy and her friend took their co-worker to hospital after she was bitten by a spider, and once she was treated, Dorothy went to get the car to take them home. While the two women waited for Dorothy, they saw her car speed straight past them with the high beams on, leaving the pair unable to see who was driving. Dorothy was never seen alive again. After hearing nothing from their friend, they reported her missing and a few hours later, her car was found burning down a back alley. A week after Dorothy vanished, her parents received a call from an unknown man, claiming that he killed their daughter. And even though these calls continued for another four years, the police were never able to trace where they were coming well, from. In 1984, in Dorothy's remains were finally found, and after the media reported her death, her parents received another call from the man asking, Is Dorothy home? This unknown caller was never found. Whoa. If you get to the photo at the end of this video, Creepy. I'm sorry. In 2005, a mysterious man dubbed the Cape Intruder petrified residents of the sleepy coastal town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, when he began breaking into their homes at night to watch them sleep. That's the creepiest thing ever. Victims describe waking up to find the Cape Intruder standing over them. But every time he ran right out of the room before anyone could catch him. He never stole anything and no one was ever hurt or touched, at least not to their knowledge. Meaning the Cape Intruder's sole purpose of the break-ins was to stand over the victims and watch them sleep. Cape Elizabeth, previously known for its postcard-worthy lighthouses, beauty, and low crime rate, was rattled and the community was living in fear. Victims worked with police to provide this chilling sketch of the suspect. People began calling police with tips of who it could be. It got to a point that everyone said he looked like someone they knew. After a few months, the Cape Intruder mysteriously stopped. Mm. To this day, he has never been identified. Meaning, the Cape Intruder is still out there. The idea of someone breaking in and watching you sleep? No, no, no. That's no. crazy. A nightmare. What are your thoughts on the Cape Intruder? Disturbing oh, crimes to ever this? take place in the state of Indiana. The employee of a fast food joint located in Speedway, Indiana shows up only to discover something weird is going on. His co-workers are missing. All the lights mm. are on and the safe and back door are wide open. In addition to this, there were two empty currency bags as well as a roll of duct tape sitting on the table right next to the safe. Initially, the assumption was that there was not much cash inside and maybe the missing employees had just taken it for a night of party. Unfortunately, the reality was was much more terrifying and the following day they would take things a lot more seriously not only would those employees fail to show up to work but they had never even made it home the <clears> night before one of their cars was found abandoned partially unlocked on the other side of town fast forward just another 24 hours and they would finally get the call everyone had been waiting on a pair of hikers 20 miles outside of town has stumbled across this extremely gruesome crime scene there are four deceased mm. victims all of which are still in their work uniforms two of those individuals had been shot to death while another Another had been bludgeoned and the last individual had been stabbed. It was at this point investigators realized a terrible mistake had been made. That Friday, on the night of the kidnapping, they had never actually declared the restaurant an official crime scene. Therefore, it had been cleaned several times since then. And unfortunately, because of this, not another single piece of evidence would be recovered from That's the restaurant stuff. itself. More so, those deceased victims still had all their jewelry and or money on them, leading many to believe this was not simply a botched robbery. Hmm. This would go on to become known as the Burger Chef murders, and although there was a very prominent suspect, no one was ever convicted of the crime. Six years later, in 1984, a man by the name of Donald Forrester comes forward saying he was part of it. He knew about things like part of a knife that broke off in one of the victims, as well as leading police to some 38 caliber shell casings which he had flushed down a toilet. They were still inside the septic tank. Later on, he would recant all of his statements saying police coerced him into making this confession. Mm. With no direct evidence linking him to the crime itself, they were not able to pursue things any further. And as time went on, this would eventually be noted as one of the most. Dang. Yo, there's probably so many people out here that's just killers. Just out here, though. You know? Just walking the streets. Got away with it. This is one of the most horrific manners of death I have ever heard of. Proceed with caution. This case is very graphic. Hella and Richard Kraft married in 1979 and settled down in Newtown, Connecticut, eventually having three children together. 
Helen was a flight attendant and Richard was an Eastern Airlines pilot who was also a volunteer constable and was a part-time police officer in Southbury. In September of 1986, Hella found out that Richard was having multiple affairs and had met with a divorce attorney. She also hired a private investigator. Mm -hmm. The private investigator had captured photos of Richard kissing another flight attendant in front of her home and this settled it. Hella was going to leave him. But on November 18th, Hella's friends had dropped her off at her and Richard's home after she got done working a long international flight. This would be the last time Hella would ever be seen again. That night, a huge snowstorm hit, and by the next morning, Richard said he was taking Hella and the kids to his sister's home in Westport, but when he arrived, Hella was not with him. Her friends knew Richard had a bad temper and grew concerned, but Richard always gave them an excuse as to why they couldn't get a hold of her. First, he said she was visiting her mom in Denmark, then said she was visiting the Canary Islands with a friend, and then said that he simply just didn't know where she was at. Hella wasn't reported missing until December 1st, and because of Richard's high status in the community, police initially didn't want to investigate him. It wasn't until December 26th, when police searched Richard's home while he was away, that they found pieces of carpet that had been ripped up from the master bedroom floor. Police also found a blood smear on the side of the bed. Mm. The crafts nanny came forward and recalled that a dark stain had appeared on that area of carpet, which was later missing. Richard's credit card reports also showed several odd purchases around the time Hella went missing, including a large freezer that was not found in the house, bed sheets, and the rental of a wood chipper and a truck. They also found the receipt for a chainsaw. A local man who was driving the town snowplow soon came forward and stated that on the night of November 18th, hours after Hella was last seen, he spotted a rental truck driven by Richard with a wood chipper attached, parked close to the shore of Lake Zor. Upon searching, investigators Richard. discovered human tissue, the crown of a tooth, a fingernail with pink nail polish, bone chips, over 2,000 pieces of blonde human he hair, and O-type blood, oh. which matched Hella's. In the lake, authorities found a chainsaw covered in blonde hair and blood, which also matched Hella's DNA. The tooth crown also positively matched to Hella's dental records. Furthermore, the serial code on the chainsaw matched to that of Richard's receipt. Authorities concluded that Richard struck Hella in the head, sitting the carpet with blood, and then kept her body in the freezer for hours until she was frozen solid, then cutting her apart with a chainsaw and feeding the pieces through the wood chipper. Richard was arrested and his first murder trial ended in a hung jury because Hella's body was never officially recovered. But after a second trial, he was found guilty and sentenced to 50 years in prison. But because of good behavior and not being a threat to the community, he was released from prison in June of last year and is now living at a halfway house in New Haven. Wow. Man, that's crazy. Threw her in a wood chipper though. Oh, oh what? Really what? I screwed in my so how do I get my car? Your car is totaled. It's what? Your car is totaled. Totaled? Totaled, wrecked. Okay, so how do I get it to your school? You don't. So, then, I don't go to school tomorrow, is what you're telling me? No, ma'am. Let me be honest with you. You go to jail, you don't have a bond, you kill two people tonight. I don't think you understand that. You do not have a bond. You are not getting out of jail. Your car is property of East Peoria Police Department because it's a crime scene. It killed two people tonight. You are clueless with that, clearly. I've already explained this to you. You're going to jail for reckless homicide tonight. You're going to jail for aggravated DUI for killing two people. That's what's going on. So no, you're not going to school tomorrow. Not you're not to getting your car out of inbound. Did you just hear what I just told you? You said I'm not going tomorrow. What? I'm talking about Tuesday. Did you hear what I said you that said you... I'm going to jail oh. tomorrow. Did you, you're going to jail when we're down here? Yes. Did you understand what I told that you killed two people tonight? Yes. Yeah, so I'm just wondering when I can go to school. She is... Okay. We're done. Cool, cool. I've seen this video a long time ago. Look, they went in a car and drove off. That's crazy. Scary movies you must watch. Part three. Black phone. Separation, huh? Man, I haven't seen any of these movies. Run. Oh, nope. I haven't seen this one either. Yeah, I ain't seen any of those. Slender Man case. What's this all about?
41 times. Betty Gore was born on January 9th, 1950, and while she was attending college, she met a teaching assistant named Alan Gore through one of her classes. Two of them immediately hit it off, they began dating, and in 1970, Alan and Betty decided to get married. Soon after their wedding, they had their first daughter named Alyssa, and after this, they decided to move to the small town of Wiley, Texas to start a new life. Now, at first, their marriage seemed to be great. They were very in love with each other, and they were excited to grow their family. However, according to reports, Betty did struggle with anxiety and occasional depression. Alan would often have to travel for work, so this meant that Betty was home alone with Alyssa, and this would just cause her a lot of anxiety. She would constantly be calling his office to check in on him. She would call the hotel he was staying at just to mm. talk to him. The traveling was causing a lot of issues in their relationship, and since they had just moved to a new town, Betty didn't really have a lot of friends. She wanted to be more active in the community, so she decided to join her local church, and that's when she began making friends. She started to become friends with a woman named Candace Montgomery, also known as Candy. They both sang in the choir, and Candy. the reason they started to become closer is because Betty's daughter, Alyssa, started to grow closer to Candy's daughter. Now, a little bit about Candy. She was married to a man named Pat Montgomery, and the two of them lived a very comfortable life in Wiley, Texas. Her husband had a very good job, so she was able to stay home and take care of their two kids. And she had a very nice house. They actually called her house the party house because that's where everyone would get together to hang out. She was friends with everyone in the community. I mean, she was kind of like your typical PTA mom. But even though Betty had joined the church and had started making new friends, things between her and Alan were still not good. She even confided in her friend Candy and told her that her and Alan did not have sex. She just didn't know mm. what else to do or how to get the sparks going again. However, Betty ended up getting pregnant with a second daughter and she thought that this would change things between her and Alan. And it somewhat did. He was excited about their second daughter. Daughter. Candy was excited about this as well. She even threw Betty a baby shower at her own house. Alan even told Betty that they were going to take a trip to Europe, just the two of them without children, so that they could reconnect and just be with each other. So it seemed like things were going well. On Friday, June 13th, 1990, Alan was away on a business trip in Minnesota, and Betty was at home taking care of their newborn daughter, and getting everything ready for their trip to Europe. Their oldest daughter, Alyssa, actually spent the night at Candy's house, and she was supposed to come back later that day because she had swim practice. However, Alyssa and Candy's daughter really wanted to have another sleep over, so Candy called Betty and asked her if it was okay if Alyssa spent another night there. Betty told Candy that Alyssa had swim practice, and that's when Candy offered to go to Betty's house, pick up the swimsuit, and take Alyssa to practice. So hmm. Betty agreed to this plan. Later that morning, Candy stopped by Betty's house to pick up the bathing suit, and then she left. As the day continued to progress, Alan called the house just to check in on Betty, but he wasn't able to get in contact with her. He called one of the neighbors to go check on Betty, and that's when they discovered that Betty was dead. Okay, more in part two. Oh, don't leave us hanging like Jeff that. Epstein didn't kill himself. At least that's what a lot of people think. And here's some of the evidence that they cite when they talk about this case. So after his initial arrest, Jeffrey Epstein was placed on suicide watch for a number of reasons, even though he was continuously telling prison psychologists, friends, attorneys that he wouldn't do that and he's never considered it. So first of all, let's take a look at this sign. This is a sign that was hanging on or around Jeffrey Epstein's jail cell. No one knows why this question mark is around the mandatory. Hmm. A newspaper even reached out to the Bureau of Prisons to ask about why there was an underlying question mark here, but they refused to comment. 7.49 on the night before they found Epstein dead in his cell. He's led to his cell and he's placed there. So Epstein had been on suicide watch for weeks at this point, but he had just been taken off suicide watch the day before. The people running the prison, the Bureau of Prison System, they recommended that Jeffrey Epstein needed to have a roommate at all times. Even if he had been taken off of the list, he was still on the list, if you know what I mean. Well, for some reason, that night his roommate was not assigned to him, they were removed from the cell, and that left Jeffrey Epstein completely alone in his jail cell. Now, remember this sign that said that they have to search his cell and look at Jeffrey Epstein every 30 minutes? Well, that did not happen. Well, it turns out that the two security guards that were supposed to check on him every 30 minutes, Michael Thomas and Tova Noel, did not check on him for over eight hours. Video surveillance footage literally shows them playing with their phones and sleeping on the job. And keep in mind that Epstein at this point was America's most high profile criminal. This dude was all over the news. And after all this, these two were charged with falsifying documents and attempting to defraud the federal mm -hmm. government. So Dang, something that's you know always about kind that. of rubbed me the wrong way about all this is the security camera footage itself. Now, this is a prison. Every angle should have been being captured at every single moment. You know, anything can happen in prison and video footage of the security guards exists from that night, but there is no video footage of Epstein's cell block area or his cell door. It's actually been reported that the camera that was shooting the angle down Jeffrey Epstein's cell block area corrupted the night that he took his own life. Of all times for this one specific camera to corrupt what? and the footage to be lost, it was corrupted. that night when it happened. And there's a lot more that we're gonna get into, but like I said, there's just a lot here that we're gonna cover, but 
This quote really says a lot about what I just told you. So Epstein's taken off suicide watch the day before he kills himself. His roommate is removed from the cell. The cameras on his tier are not working. The guards fell asleep. It seems almost impossible to think all those things could happen in that way. And this is Epstein we're talking about, America's most high profile prisoner. In fact, the suicide watch observation log, this is the actual document, shows that Epstein was acting pretty normally that day. Which isn't to say that he wasn't deceiving people by saying he didn't want to take his own life when he was secretly trying to get alone time where he could do it, but, but it's still an interesting side note. In the next TikTok, we're going to get into the really crazy stuff. Yo, that's hey, what's your thoughts on that, man? Like, I don't know. I, it, it was always fishy to me. It's crazy to believe that these are true crime TikToks. Guys, if you like the content, don't forget to subscribe, turn your notification bell on, and until next time, YouTube, peace.